All right, we're going to be in verse 12, John 12, 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. It is Palm Sunday. Amen. And I don't know about you guys, but usually when I come to church on um, all the different services I've been to over the years, it's a very celebratory, joyful time. I will never forget when my girls were in a choir at church and hundreds of littles, they're with them and they all come out and they're waving their paper palms and we're like singing and clapping and taking pictures and it's so great and it's so joyous. And I hate to be a party pooper, but I'm one of those people who I don't really know why we celebrate like that. Don't get me wrong. I understand the significance of the palms. Y'all, my, my computer's freaking out up here. I understand the significance of the palms. He was getting the praise and the honor that he deserves, and that's all great. But I can't help but pay attention to that just a few days later, those people that were cheering him are either going to remain silent on Friday or going to be yelling, crucify him on Friday. The word tells us many stopped believing in him that week. So, don't stone me for saying that I don't have the best celebration on Palm Sunday because I think we need to be more reflective because people were turning their backs on Jesus because by Friday, instead of praise and honor, he was getting pain and punishment. What the heck happened? That things shifted so quickly within just a couple of days. And so today, I don't want to just talk about Sunday. I want to talk about what happened Monday through Friday. Because to me, that's where like real life sits. Right? So in order to figure out what does this mean to us, why are we talking about this, Pastor Nicole, we need some context. So first and foremost, it says there was a great crowd. There were a lot of people in this crowd. There were people that followed him from Bethany because they had seen him raise Lazarus to life. There were Greeks in the crowd. We know the Pharisees were there. The Bible tells us all of this. And I would really highly recommend that you go home, if you haven't already, and read the account of Palm Sunday in each gospel because you're going to get a different detail from each one. So they're all there, but the majority of the crowd were the common Jewish people. They had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So the Passover, for those of you who don't know, this is when they would celebrate God um, rescuing them from Egyptian slavery and saving their firstborn sons. So they're all there for this celebration. And they're all crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. It means save me. And so after everything that they had heard and seen Jesus do, they're like crying out, we believe you. We believe you're coming to save us. You're the Messiah. And they're waving these palm branches. And I want to talk about these palm branches for a minute because this wasn't just by chance. There's symbolism in these palm branches. They're waving them because they're actual symbols of Israelite independence from the king of Syria 134 years prior. Well, actually more than that, 160-something years, but I don't do math. So at that time, the king of Syria, Syria, which, by the way, I always mess up Bible names, so give me some grace if I don't say this right, but I believe it's King Antichias. Antichias. I'm that girl that tries to avoid the Bible names when I'm talking because I never get them right. So at that time, he was suppressing the Jewish people, and particularly their religious customs, because he wanted to spread Hellenism. Okay? He believed that man was the measure of all things. And so think about how threatening it must have been that the Jewish people thought God was the measure of all things. And so he invades their temple and he destroys the Holy of Holies. So once again, the Israelites find themselves oppressed. It's a bit of a theme in the Bible. But then we have the Maccabees. Anybody know the Maccabees? Okay. So I'm going to tell you, don't worry. They were Jewish rebel soldiers. Okay. This is like, this is when my husband's like, yes, rebel soldiers. Let's get an op plan going. (laughs) And they did. And they were led by Judah Maccabee, that's hence the name, the Maccabees. Okay, they rise up against the king of Syria, and they use army guerrilla warfare. Mm -hmm. Some of you thought guerrilla warfare didn't come in until Vietnam. Not true. And they actually succeed 
and taking back the temple and restoring it, and they get a military victory. They, they get political power because of this victory. And do you want to know how the people celebrated that military victory? With palm branches. It's all written. You can read it in the book of Maccabees. They're not in the Bible, but they are Jewish historical documents that you can access. But what's important for you to know is that the Jewish people that were there, they all know this story. They all know it. And they also all know the prophecy of the Messiah. And so here comes Jesus, and they've heard all these things about him. And so they go and they cut down palm leaves, and they're, they're waving them. Hosanna, Hosanna. They believed that he was coming to liberate them that he was coming to take back political power just like the Maccabees had done hundreds, hundreds of years earlier. They believed he was coming to overthrow the government and establish his government and save them from their current suffering. And so you guys, they're pumped. They're like, let's party. We're going to praise. We got our palm leaves. And they are shouting. By Friday, so many of those people would be silent. Others would be yelling, crucify him, crucify him, and others would just walk away and stop believing. Why? You want to know why? Because Jesus didn't meet their expectations. Within just a couple of days, he makes his message and his purpose, they're very clear. And it was a hard and holy way, and it did not fit the mold of what they desired or they expected. And so I want us to look at that week and see what Jesus said and what did he do that made them turn so quickly? How did he not meet their expectations? First and foremost, and you guys, I'm going to go through a bunch of things that covers like the whole Holy Week. So if you don't know what I'm referencing in this, go read the Gospels and read these stories. If I did it today, you guys, we'd be here for 13 hours. I mean, it's snowing. I guess we got time. We got time? Okay. I'm just kidding. First thing he does. He comes in on a donkey. I don't know about you guys, but I picture Shrek and donkey, and it's a whole thing. But back then, men of great power, men of stature, they didn't ride in on donkeys. They came in on stately horses or magnificent chariots. And yet Jesus chose a very low, slow animal that was used specifically for service. And right out of the gate, he's saying, your ways are not my ways. He came without an army, and he came with disciples. Your ways are not my ways. He went straight to the temple, not to the palace. Your ways are not my ways. Then he curses a fig tree. What? Some people think he was hangry. The fig tree was a tree, it had beautiful leaves, but when he walked up to the tree, there was no fruit. And it wasn't even in season, so why did he get so mad and curse the tree? He did it as a rebuke of the Jewish people. He said, you've turned away from truth. And what he's really saying to all of us in that curse is that I don't care if you look holy on the outside. Come to church. Walk the walk on the outside. But if you're not holy on the inside and actually producing fruit for my kingdom, get away from me. And so by now, I'm sure the Jewish people are like, sheesh, I thought you were coming to save us, not rebuke us. Again, your ways are not my ways. Then he goes into the temple and he clears it. He starts flipping tables and he says, get this greed out of here. He says, this temple is a place of prayer, not a palace of power. Your ways are not my ways. And so by now, You can imagine people are starting to turn their backs on him. And at the end of that week, he's supposed to be a master. And you want to know what he does? He washes his disciples' feet. Again, your ways are not my ways. And throughout that week, he's doing all of these teachings. And he starts teaching about his way, the way that's not our way. And he's saying it's hard. It's narrow. And so I want us to look back at John 12 at one of these teachings. We're going to start in verse 23, John 12, verse 23. So just a little bit further down from where we're reading. 
Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone, and this next scripture is so important, church, listen, anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the ones who serve me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to them. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Can I get an amen? Amen. And this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law of the Messiah that the Messiah will reign forever. So how can you say, do you hear them questioning him already? How can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Jesus came and proclaimed that he must lay his life down, and that so must we. And they didn't like that, because a message of self-sacrifice was not what they wanted to hear. That was not the victory they were looking for. And in the very next verse, it says, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. You see, many in the crowd had shallow faith. Some, they just came for entertainment. Oh, what's he going to do next? He just brought Lazarus back from the dead. Jesus. Others came because they were threatened by him. And I really don't think that sounds much different than the church today. How many are sitting in the church today with shallow faith or for entertainment or maybe even because they're threatened? And many of those people in the crowd turn their backs on him because of unmet expectations. And it's really no different than what's happening today in our society. Hello, deconstruction. Look back at verse 42. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. Okay, hey, that's positive. Some of the Jewish leaders are believing in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. The crowd had influence over the individual as well. The Jewish leaders who actually believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they didn't want to publicly confess their faith because they didn't want to give up the comfort and the familiarity of what was happening in church. Because they would have been put out because it was a bold belief. And so they said nothing. They had to choose the way of the crowd or the way of Jesus. And then we have Pilate on Friday. So Pilate's the Roman governor who Jesus was brought before. And because of the crowd, because of fearing the crowd, he knew Jesus was innocent, the Bible tells us. And yet, he listened to the crowd and he handed him over to be crucified. He had to choose the way of the crowd or the way of Jesus. And then we have poor Peter. Jesus' own beloved disciple because of fear of the crowd would deny Christ not once, not twice, but three separate times. And so the crowd shifts on Jesus. He didn't meet their expectations. They wanted a conquering king, but they got a humble servant. Jesus didn't come with a sword and an army. He came with peace and a sacrifice. He didn't come to overthrow the Roman government. He came to defeat sin and death. And you guys, they missed it. They missed him because the crowd is alluring. It's common. It's comfortable. But the way of the cross is hard but holy. The Savior was right in front of them. But in their disappointment and in their unmet expectations, they missed it. But if we're being really honest with ourselves, church, we're no different than they are. 
We have to ask ourselves, how do we respond when he doesn't meet our expectations, when he doesn't perform the way that I want him to perform? When I am disappointed, how do I respond to the Lord? We all have our own Hosanna cry. We all need saving from something. Maybe for some of you, it's infertility and you're still waiting for that answered prayer. Maybe for others, it's a prodigal son that's just further away from the Lord than they've ever been. Maybe for others, it's you're waiting for that healing miracle while you watch everybody else around you get theirs. Maybe it's loneliness or addiction or pride. We all have our Hosanna cry. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we going to follow the crowd or are we going to follow Christ? In the waiting and in the unmet expectations, in the disappointments, are we missing him? Are we missing the bigger thing he's trying to do in the midst of our suffering? It's not always saving us from our suffering. It's what he's doing in the midst of it. So Jesus made it really clear, you guys. It's very clear if you read the Bible. It is not going to be easy if you say yes to him. He never says, come with me and I'm just going to make everything nice and pretty, cozy from here on out. I wish. No. And I'm afraid that we choose the way of the crowd way too often. It's really easy to come to church on Sunday, but then live like the crowd Monday through Saturday. But listen to Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Because that's a very sobering scripture. In what ways have we chosen the crowd over the cross? And I want us to genuinely consider this as a church today. And so I'm going to ask us to look at some pieces of our society, the crowd, today, and compare it, right? Let's see, what does the cross say? What does the crowd say? And where do I sit with that? Remember, don't stone me. I'm just speaking scripture. There's going to be a lot of scripture references up here. So get ready, because I can't read them all. We'd be here all day. Get your camera out if one speaks to you, and I want you to go to these scriptures. So we're going to look at some things about what the crowd says today. Number one, the crowd says, glorify yourself. It's all about you. You do you, boo, whatever makes you feel good. But the cross says, glorify God. It's not about you. The crowd says, take care of you first. But the cross says, value others above yourself. You want to know how we take care of you first? By glorifying God. Let him soak into you, and he will give you everything you need to serve others before yourself. The crowd says, never enough. More money, more fame, more food, more things, more power. But the cross says, less is more. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. And when it comes to parenting, and I know I'm going to step on some of your toes now, let the child lead. Let their sports, their emotions, and their lives take center stage and priority in your life. But the cross says, seek first the kingdom of God. Train up a child in the way he should go in the way of the Lord, because discipline yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I know some of you are really going to hate me, but it's not me. It's the word. The crowd says sex outside of marriage with whoever you want, whenever you want, go for it. Mm. The cross says keep the marriage bed pure. When it comes to how we communicate, okay, I want you to think about social media, any platform that you have, whether it's at school or work or in a friend group. The crowd says, you know what, go ahead and air your opinions without discourse. Say what you want to say, everything you feel. The cross says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, and let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except for that which is meant to build others up. And when it comes to finances, I know, some of you are going to leave now. Earn more, the crowd says. Hold on tight to it. Create that security net for yourself. But the cross says it this, and it's simple. Give to those in need and tithe. 
I mean, there's a lot more scriptures I could have wrote there, but that's it. Give to those in need and tithe. When it comes to what we consume, the crowd says, you know what? Consume what you want, when you want. Go ahead and watch that TV show and listen to that secular music that has all that foul language and the sex and the violence. You do that. But the cross says, dwell on that which is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and praiseworthy. And may there not even be a hint of immorality or impurity in you. That not even a hint is what makes my heart convicted every single time. Not even a hint of impurity or immorality. You guys, we could go on and on and on talking about the crowd, but really what we're talking about is choosing between a lie and a truth. It's choosing the way of Satan or choosing the way of the Lord. There's no other, two, there's no other way in between. It's black and white. It's really about setting aside our flesh so that God can do a work in us. And listen, y'all, the older I get, the more I know I don't know. (laughs) I don't care how long you've been in the church, we all still have work to do. God is not done with us. Again, the way of the crowd is common and comfortable. So where is your life common and comfortable? That might be the place you need to look first. And go to the word. Not your bestie not the people at work, not the news. The way of the cross is hard but holy. Listen to the way of the cross. Be holy because he is holy. Walk in his ways, not your ways, his ways. Be imitators of Christ. Take his yoke upon you. Learn from him. Be gentle and lowly. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. So I will ask you again, have you chosen the crowd over the cross? Because the Lord says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And I believe he is telling us to step into the power and the life of the Holy Spirit, whom he has given to those who believe. If we want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we need to get real about how we're living. We can't just talk about it. We have to be about it. Thank you, honey. He says that at home all the time. It sticks with me. And I am afraid that the Western church has chosen the easy route to blend in with the crowd instead of stand out for Christ. But you guys, I want you to hear something. The anointing oil does not come with ease. It comes from the pressing. That's really true. That's true. You have to squeeze that olive. It has to go under this pressure process to get the oil. I believe the Lord in this season is asking us to get rid of all the things that are not of him and to stop playing church and be the church. It's time to go deeper and get real with God. Because you guys, I hate to say it, but things aren't getting any easier. And this year, I have a feeling we're going to have some unmet expectations and disappointments. Hello, it's an election year. And I'm not trying to be like a gloom and doom prophet and be like, oh, everything's going to... Anyone can look around and see the chaos and the confusion and the division and the hate. And church, what are we going to do if we get disappointed? How are we going to act in our unmet expectations? Are we going to live in fear and anger and division like the rest of the world? Or are we going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? If we want to walk with the Spirit, we have to stop grieving the Spirit with the way that we live. Church, we have to rise up and be set apart. Set apart apart. We cannot afford to be silent. We cannot afford to blend into the crowd because the world is desperate for hope and we have the answer. We have the good news because the reality is when Jesus came to Jerusalem that Sunday, he didn't come to meet their expectations. He came to exceed their expectations and he's still working to exceed our expectations today. He did not care about being a spectacle. He cared about being a savior And he did not come to please people. He came to save our souls. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so today as a church, we're going to think about this. We're going to ponder this. We're going to remember this. And we're going to take communion together as a church. So I'm going to ask the dream team to start getting ready to pass that out, to pass that out, and then the worship team to come up. But church, listen, we're not done. There's a big chunk of my message. Okay, but we just need, we need this in our hands. So try to pay attention, okay? Okay. Here's what I want you to hear. 
because that's kind of a lot to swallow. (laughs) He doesn't ask us to lose our life and lay it down to choose the hard but holy way to condemn us or to control us. He doesn't. It's because he wants to lead us on a path of abundant life, a life of peace, a life that leads to eternity in heaven instead of hell. The Lord does not ask us to lose our life and lay it down without first doing it himself. And you know what? He, he, what he did for us on that cross far exceeds anything we can do for ourselves or anything that the world has to offer us. He doesn't call us to the way of the cross to prove our worth either. He already said we were worth it when he went to the cross for us. And you guys, this, this is not a list of rules. It's the way, the truth, and the life. It's not a bunch of markers that we have to try to measure up to. It's actually how we walk in the freedom that he died for. He doesn't give us commands so we can try in our own strength to measure up or earn our worth. He gives them so we can experience heaven on earth so that we can have peace and joy and patience and forgiveness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. And you guys, that sounds a whole lot better to me than anything this world could ever offer. And so as we head into Holy Week, reflecting on the way of the cross, let's take it all before him and remember what he did for us. He went to the cross. And the weight of our sin and our shame and our sorrows, it was lifted when those nails went through his hands and his feet. He gave up his spirit that day and he defeated the enemy. He washed away brokenness and made a way for us to become new. He was mocked. He was beaten. He suffocated so that we could be with him forever in heaven. You guys, he loves us that much and I want you to think about that. I'm never gonna forget the day that I realized what he did for me and the love he had for me. And it wasn't that long ago. (laughs) I was raised a believer I've told this story before. I walked away from church for a lot of years. Always believed in God, but I walked away from church. I rededicated my life to Christ. I knew, I knew his forgiveness. I knew he saved me. I knew what he did for me, but I could never really get that he loved me. Does that make sense? It just, does he really love me? And then one day when my youngest daughter, she was four years old and we ended up in the hospital and She had ended up there because of influenza A and and a severe asthmatic reaction. And we're sitting there and all these alarms start going off and these doctors and nurses, they rush in the room and there's so many of them, you guys, that Eddie and I were literally pinned up against a wall and we couldn't even see our little girl. And I'm just crying out to God, save her, save her. And do you wanna know what he said to me? He said, Nicole, would you let her die if it would save everybody else in this hospital? And I was mad. He didn't meet my expectations in that moment because you want to know what I wanted him to do? I wanted him to comfort me and I wanted him to make my little girl sit up like Lazarus. And I was so angry at him. Like, really, Lord? That's what you're asking me in this moment? And at the same time, I thought to myself, but I couldn't. I couldn't do it, Lord. And I don't know if I said this out loud or not. I feel like I did. It was so loud in that room. And I just said, if she goes, my heart's going to stop beating. Never forget it. You want to know what he said to me? Nicole, I gave up my son for you because I love you more than you could ever love your little girl. And in that moment, I didn't think there was a love greater than a mother's love. And so I looked, I, I literally was like, that's what you're telling me right now? Like, Wow. In this moment, though, Lord, like, this is what you're saying? But then I realized that love wasn't just for me. It was for my little girl and her sister and her dad and every single person in that hospital and everybody here today. And we sat in that ICU trusting that if he loves us that much, we have to trust that no matter the outcome, it's for our good. And for eight days, we didn't know if she was going to make it. But by his grace, she's doing the news. (laughs) That same love that was in that room that day, 
sent Jesus to the cross for you. Every single one of you. I don't care what you've done. He doesn't care the mess you've made or the mistakes you've made. He doesn't care how many times you've chosen the crowd over him. He laid down his life for you because he loves you that much.